Welcome to our review of the cooperative board game, Disney Sidekicks. Thanks, Spin Master, for sending us a review copy of this game to check out. Disney Sidekicks was designed by Eric M. Lang and features artwork from Greg May. It was published in 2021 by Spin Master Games. Now, the game says two to four players on the box, though I honestly don't see any reason you couldn't play this solo, like many cooperative games. Now, a game of sidekicks takes under an hour, sometimes way under an hour, if you've got some bad luck going on. Sidekicks has an MSRP of $30, $29.99 specifically, and should be available through both the mass market and hobby game retail chains. Now, in Disney Sidekicks, players get to kick it into hero mode as one of five popular Disney sidekicks working together with the other players to rescue their heroes and defeat at least one of Disney's most infamous villains. Along the way, they will have to deal with the villain's henchmen, defeat guards, and rescue villagers in order to learn new skills for their sidekicks. Check out our Disney Sidekicks unboxing video on YouTube for a look at the components you get with this game. Now quickly, you get a rule book that features one of the best component overviews I've seen in a game, as well as a useful gameplay summary on the back. I wish more publishers did both of these things. There's a nice looking two-sided board, which is used at different player counts. The board box does come with a single, rather thin cardboard punch board that holds some of the smallest tokens I've ever seen in a board game. These are so tiny, I was worried I would lose some just while unboxing the game for the first time. And this is always a concern, especially depending on the age ranges that a game is targeted at. Correct. Now, other components include oversized cards for the sidekicks and villains, standard sized danger cards and power cards, a custom six sided die, a plastic castle and bridges, and miniatures for the sidekicks and villains. And I gotta say, I was especially impressed by these miniatures. I can see a Disney van buying this game just for those miniatures. All right, well, now that we have an idea of what you get in the box, how about you give us an overview of how Disney Sidekicks is played? All right, pretty simple. Start by putting the board out on its appropriate side, put the castle in the middle, and add all the bridges. Seed the board with guards and villagers, and then have everyone pick a sidekick. Now, the sidekicks included in this game are Abu from Aladdin, Lumiere from Beauty and the Beast, Timon and Pumbaa from The Lion King, Tinkerbell from Peter Pan, and the three fairy godmothers, who count as one character, from Sleeping Beauty. For each sidekick, the player is going to collect their character card, their miniature, which is placed on a starting spot, a reference card, a health token placed at the end of their health track, one star token, and their hero token, note hero is different than the sidekick, which is placed inside the castle. Players then shuffle their power cards and draw three, which they place face up. Remaining power cards are returned to the box. So a nice range of characters from a wide range of properties across more than 50 years mm -hmm. of Disney history. Yeah, I think they did a really good job of grabbing iconic characters here. Because next up, you get the villains. Each sidekick has a matching villain. Now, in the same order as before, you have Jafar, Gaston, Scar, Captain Hook, and of course, Maleficent. You're going to follow the setup instructions on the back of each villain card. These vary by villain. So, for example, Hook has you place a token out for the Jolly Roger in one of the, uh, the river areas, whereas Maleficent has you place curse tokens on specific areas of the map. Uh, a bit of asymmetry in the setup, but by way of the opponents of your chosen characters rather than your yes. own characters. So there is some asymmetry with the characters, which I'll get into when I start describing their abilities. Now, finally, you're going to build the danger deck. What you're going to do is collect all the cards for the villains in play and add two standard danger cards that are used every game and shuffle these all together. Now, if somehow you are finding the game too easy, you also have three additional sets of danger cards that can be added to make things more difficult, ranging from almost impossible to even the designer can't win it, as far as I can tell. I very strongly suggest forgetting these even exist. I originally read this as Danger Duck, and now I'm disappointed. Now, is that a Disney license, Danger Duck? I, I remember Darkwing Duck. Hey, yeah, it's Danger, yeah, that's Danger, Danger Duck. Yeah. That, that one's past my Disney knowledge. Now, gameplay in Disney Sidekicks is similar to many other popular cooperative games, where on a player's turn, something bad happens, then the player gets to act, spending a set amount of action points to choose between different actions. Now, victory is achieved if the players manage to save all of the heroes and defeat at least one villain. 
Now, defeat for the hero or hero sidekicks. Sorry, I always want to say heroes because I just think you use play the heroes, right? So, defeat for the sidekicks for the players can come in many forms. The players lose if even one sidekick is defeated, if three bridges on the board are destroyed, if the castle is filled with a mix of five guards or villagers, or if a villain specific defeat condition is reached. These are on the specific villain cards. For example, if Maleficent gets all her curse tokens out, you lose the game. So pretty standard, a lot of ways to lose, mm. since as we've discussed often before, co-op games shouldn't be too easy to win, or where's the fun in playing? Only true. Now each game start, each turn, going around the table starts with drawing a danger card. These will have you complete up to three steps, with most cards having all three, some not having all of them. Starting by adding villagers to the map. Now if at any point, when adding villagers to the map, you end with three villagers in the same spot, one's captured and sent to the castle. Remember, if the castle ever has five villagers and or guards, the players lose. Remember, social distancing don't crowd up. Well, there you go. The game's even timely. Next is the danger rises phase. Uh, this is the middle part of the card. You're just going to read it out loud and do what it says. These type of events lead to things like um, different things happening on the board, and they're based on what villain card deck it comes from so for example hook will have the jolly roger attack anyone who's adjacent to that river or maleficent will start cursing more areas of the board finally on the last part of the card you will either place a guard token where the sidekick who's going is or the appropriate villain will move towards that their sidekick sorry not necessarily the one who drew the card but the matching sidekick and then stop and attack any adjacent sidekicks from where they end up now, I talked about attacks here. These are made by rolling a custom die a number of times equal to the number of attack tokens on the villain. Uh, for example, Scar has three, whereas Maleficent has one. Now, you roll the die, and if you have like these scratch marks, those count as hits from the villains, and that each hit removes one health from the sidekick. The sidekick ever runs out of health, of course, the players lose. Now, when placing guards, because some of these cards will tell you to place guards, if they're ever two guard tokens in the same spot, they don't need the reinforcement and one moves back to the castle. Remember, if you get a mix of five guards or villagers in the castle, you lose. Again, pretty standard for co-op stuff. You do the bad thing, then you do a specific opponent bad thing, check to make sure nothing horrible has ended things, and then the player can finally go. Yeah, this is familiar to many other co-op games. So assuming you haven't lost at this point, which can be a pretty big assumption, you then get to take actions with your hero. Each hero has either three or four action points to spend. Actions include moving your sidekick to an adjacent spot, jumping over any spots occupied by other sidekicks or villains. Note, if you move on to a spot with a guard or henchman, they will attack you. Your next option is to attack a henchman in your spot or an adjacent villain, because the miniatures never are on the same spot. And it has to be a villain you haven't attacked yet this turn, which is a weird way of saying you can only attack each villain once. You can unlock the castle, the gates, by spending five star tokens. There's lock tokens for this that you flip to the unlock side. If there's an unlock token at the castle, you can then spend that to free your hero. And finally, you can, or sorry, not finally, you can also rescue villagers. You move your around the board to where the villagers are and you rescue them by removing them from the board and you potentially gain a new power. I'll get into that in a moment. The final action is resting, which allows you to either recover one health or gain one star. No, you can only rest once per turn, no matter how many actions you have. Right. So a, a pretty normal list of possible actions. They're not limiting you, but they're also not making it easy to decide mm. what you might want to do on a turn. Yeah, this is a little more complex than even, say, Pandemic, which is considered by many a gateway cooperative game. You have more possible things you can do in this game. Now, we talked about attacks again. Attacking with a sidekick, again, uses the custom die, but you're looking for Mickey's glove, showing a thumbs up this time and every Mickey's glove does one damage to the target. Now, most henchmen are removed from the board if hit, but when villains are hit, you actually remove star tokens from their player board and get them for the player. So this is one of the ways to get star tokens. Now, many villains also have additional rules to follow when they're hit. For example, hitting Maleficent is the way to remove those curse tokens. Now, if a villain loses their last star token, they're defeated, removed from play, along with any of their tokens in play still, now, remember, the players have to defeat at least one villain to win the game. Now, along with the two different attack symbols on the dice, there's also a side showing a star. If this is rolled at any time, the player rolling gets a star token immediately, regardless if they're rolling for their hero, a villain, or a henchman. 
So uh, with the makeup of the dice, you do get a 66% chance of your sidekick hitting, though some of those are also a bad guy hit back at you as well, mm. uh, and a 17% chance of a free star every time you attack. Now, when players rescue a villager, getting back to that, you're going to take the token from the board and you get to place it on one of those three face-up power cards you put out at the start of the game. And it has to go on a power card that doesn't already have a villager of that color on it. Now, each of these cards has two to four spots on it, and once all of them are filled, the player earns that power. Now, each of these powers breaks the rules in some way, giving all kinds of things like additional attacks, more movement, healing, re-rolls, uh, gaining stars every turn, and so on. There are a lot of these cards actually included in the game, which actually adds quite a bit to the replay value. Now, along with these power cards, each individual hero also has their own asymmetric power, which they start with at the beginning of the game. For example, Tinkerbell can move anywhere for one movement. Timon and Pumbaa can heal. Lumiere can re-roll dice. Now, one neat bit here that I really like is that each hero can also spend one star token to use their ability on another hero, or sorry, another sidekick during their turn. So Tinkerbell can move someone else, or Timon and Pumbaa can heal another sidekick. So player asymmetry, but a very helpful version of it. Yes. <laughs> Now, in addition to being one of the win conditions, when a hero is rescued, the sidekick that saved them keeps the token on their player board, and that gives them one additional action each turn. Trust me, you're going to want more actions. Play continues around the table with every player drawing a danger card, doing what it says, and then taking actions until either the players win or the game defeats them. Well, that doesn't sound bad at all. Uh, what is it you thought and your family thought of the game? So the thing with Disney sidekicks is that when you see this game, the, the box for the game, you can't help but expect a light, fun, family weight game with a cool Disney theme that's a little different. You're playing the sidekicks instead of the heroes. That's just neat. Even seeing Eric Lang's name in the box as someone who knows who Eric Lang is, you expect an engaging, cooperative experience that kids will love, but that has enough depth that gamers will also have fun playing. You see the game at Target or Walmart or on Amazon and think, this is a great game for Disney fans of all ages. The problem is thinking this is wrong. Disney Sidekicks is a fairly complex and wickedly difficult cooperative game that even the most experienced cooperative game players are going to find hard to win. The game is fiddly and punishing without adding in any of the extra difficulty cards. Those ones I basically told you to forget about. Even the basic game, as it's designed, is difficult. Now, added to this, there are some rulebook ambiguities that can lead to arguments at the table about the proper way to play the game, and you never want that on a family game night. Yeah, well, I'm all about tricky co-ops, but rulebook problems, that is a whole other ball of wax. Now, in more detail, that's just kind of an overview of my thoughts on the game. Let, let's start with the components. They are a total mixed bag. I don't think I've ever opened one box and had such mixed feelings about various different components. Now, the miniatures are a highlight. While they're not hobby miniature quality, there's no Games Workshop level minis in this box, they are great representations of the characters they represent. The bridges are also cool. They're 3D, like the piece of plastic, and the castle looks good in the center of the table, though the castle really isn't all that functional. Passing hero tokens in the middle just makes it a pain to get them out later, and there's no place to put those lock-unlock tokens. And the spots to hold the guard villagers aren't designed to actually hold the guard or villager tokens, which are really tiny. Like each castle tower has an obviously designed hold something circular aspect to it, but the tokens you're meant to put there are much smaller than these towers. Even the lock tokens are smaller than these towers. Now, with my kids playing around the game, they did notice one of the miniatures fits perfectly up there, but there's no reason to ever put a miniature in the tower in the game. Like, I almost wonder if the tower was originally designed to serve a different purpose, and then they changed at some point what to do with it, and they never updated it. The hazards of shifting designs after component builds are locked in at manufacturer. Yeah. I don't know. It, it works. It's just odd. Now, the villager guard tokens I just mentioned are the biggest problem with this game, production-wise. Uh, the heart, star, and attack die tokens are the same thing. These are literally the worst tokens I've ever seen in a board game. And I've played a lot of board games. They are thin. They are cardboard. They're not paper, but they're super tiny. Added to that, the villager tokens need to be differentiated. And they feature two colors, an orange and a brown, that are almost identical. And if I don't play with my hue lighting, I can't tell them apart. 
And that's from someone who doesn't have any vision issues like colorblindness. Ouch. Take that, folks. We're too nice to the games we review. <laughs> now, another issue is the rulebook, as I mentioned. While it's well-designed, lots of examples, well laid up, there's actually more examples than rules, which is great. There are a few ambiguous rules. Now, on a positive note, Spin Master has published an updated rulebook on their website. You can go there and download the PDF. The problem with this is that most people buying a mass market Disney game aren't even going to consider looking online for rulebook updates or errata. That's something only hobby gamers tend to know to do. Indeed, while most hobby gamers wouldn't think twice about checking for updates, your average family game night does not involve checking the forums at BoardGameGeek. No, it does not. Now, as for the game, it's actually pretty solid. Um, setting up the board with its various villain counters and cards actually gives me a lot of flashbacks to Horrified from uh, Disney's, not Disney, bleh, Universal Monsters Horrified. Uh, and that's a good thing. Actually, quite a bit of the gameplay here reminds me of Horrified in a good way. All the rules seem to work together and work well. Moving around the board, freeing villagers, gaining new powers, and battling henchmen and village and, and um, guards is actually quite fun until you lose suddenly. Because losing in Disney sidekicks is something that's going to happen frequently and early. It is so hard that in one game, we even lost before one player had a chance to take their turn. Though I will note that was on the hardest difficulty level trying those cards I told you just to forget about. And this is one of the reasons I'm telling you to forget about. No one wants to play a game where they don't get to take a turn. Now, in most games we played, we lost due to the castle getting filled up. And that happened mainly to specific danger cards that have you place tokens on a spot and on the spots adjacent to it. This is a mechanic that's similar to outbreaks and pandemic. The limit of only one guard or two villagers on a spot can be extremely punishing. Then you throw Maleficent into the mix, which you're probably going to want to do because, well, it's Maleficent, and plus the fairy godmother is the coolest sidekick with three different little miniatures that can split up, which is really neat. Playing with Maleficent makes it worse because those curse tokens instantly send any villager added, no matter what's already on the spot. So... I strongly recommend, and here, here's my biggest tip for anyone who, who picks up this game and has listened to this, besides ignore the higher difficulty cards, like literally put them under the insert. Years later, when you've mastered the game, you can pull them out, is don't use Maleficent until you've managed to win a few times. Honestly, I have to say, from a frustration perspective, this reminds me a lot of playing through the Monster Box of Monsters with some mm. very similar unfavorable experiences. Yeah, like you literally put that on the shelf. We're yep. like, we're basically done with that for now. And I can totally see a group doing this. Now, in addition to losing due to the full castle, that was in the games we played the most common. We did have games where we lost due to heroes dying. So even having a character like Timon and Pumbaa, which is the one sidekick who can heal, well, it doesn't help if it takes three turns to get back to Timon and Pumbaa so they can heal again. Now, that's three rounds of danger direct deck danger deck draws before you get to use that ability and well in theory you read about a game like this and you're like well it's perfectly balanced because every turn bad things happen then you go so it doesn't matter how many players you're playing with but that's not true in this case honestly the easiest way to win in this game is to play two players and make sure one of those players is Tone and pumba so you can heal every other round and I would recommend Abu for your second choice because Abu lets you skip over danger cards. On his turn, he draws two cards and he discards one to the bottom. So you can throw away those. It's going to outbreak. Well, I'm using the pandemic term, but you can throw away that put the guard there. You're like, oh, no, we'll do this other one. And by spending a star, you can do it on the other player's turn. So with that team, the game becomes much more winnable. Indeed. Character choice and optimization is a factor in these sort of co-op games. But that's speaking as an experienced gamer yep. and not sitting down with a bunch of eight-year-olds who want to play their favorite characters. Yep. So all that said, Disney sidekicks can be quite fun as long as everyone knows what they're in for when they sit down to play. The key to enjoying this game is making sure all the players clearly understand the various losing conditions and making sure everyone's cool with trying multiple times to win, expecting to lose more often than not. You can have a ton of fun playing this game as long as you go in with the right expectations. A modern, complex co-op game 
and not your Hasbro family game night. Yeah, and that's my biggest worry about this game is who it seems to be marketed to. It's a Disney theme game sold in mass market stores that's most likely going to get bought by Disney fans or as gifts for Disney fans who are most likely kids. This is not in any way, in my opinion, a kid's game. While the box says 8 plus on it, I don't know many 8 year olds that could learn this game on their own, nor many who would enjoy the fiddliness and difficulty of this game. To me, Disney Sidekicks is a difficult cooperative game best enjoyed by experienced gamers. And that's not really how it's being sold. Indeed, Disney branding it as one would expect Disney to, but that has shaped expectations. To be fair, I never would have looked twice at this game if it had not had Eric's name on it. Uh, I would have simply assumed that it was a candy-coated kids experience and not a stress-inducing hobby game. So if you're an experienced gamer who enjoys cooperative games and loves a challenge, you may want to pick up Disney Sidekick especially if your group enjoys the theme and the license, the whole Disney thing. Lots of Disney fans out there. Now, if you're a fan of difficult cooperative games, and the one that comes to mind to me is Ghost Stories. For years, Ghost Stories has had a reputation of being the most difficult but winnable cooperative game out there. Well, I think it has to pass that throne on to sidekicks. I think if you dug Ghost Stories and you want that kind of challenge, there's stuff you will enjoy in this game. Now, if you're a Disney fan looking for a fun game to play with your family, something that your family will enjoy and gamers will also enjoy, I can't recommend this game. Instead, I recommend checking out Disney Villainous, sorry, Spin Master. This is more of a game that the entire family can enjoy and that I've found works great with both new and experienced gamers. Now, if you are really hooked on the theme of sidekicks, I recommend find a way to try before you buy in this case, instead of rushing out to grab this right away. Now, if you just want some cool Disney miniatures, this box, box, this box has some very cool ones. As a bonus, you get a game you might like, you might not. Just don't expect to win very often, if at all, if you do play it. For everyone else, I'm sorry to say this is a skip. Uh, Disney Sidekicks is a game that seems to have missed its mark in a number of ways. It's a game that's confused both in its target market and its component quality. While there's some neat stuff going on here, the way it's all put together keeps me from giving it a general recommendation. Well, that's it for our review of Disney Sidekicks. We'd love to hear what you thought about this game in the comments, and we welcome you to check out our more detailed written review over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com.